I'll ask it since yeah. this is to you. Donald Bangert, <laughs> yes. seed oil disrespector. I've been listening yeah. to you guys since I heard Sagar on yeah. Paul Saladino's podcast. I'm just curious if you, Sagar, consider yourself a seed oil disrespect. I love this question. So for the uninitiated, <laughs> there is a huge debate online. I need to get in on this debate. My name is James Lee. Welcome to another segment of 5149 on Breaking Points, where we dive into different topics at the intersection of business, politics, and society. And today we're going to try to answer this question. Is there something about the food that we're eating that is causing us to be fatter and sicker than we've ever been in history? We'll start with an interesting graph, the one that you see on your screen from a paper published earlier this year in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition, a peer-reviewed primary research journal in nutrition and dietetics showing trends in U.S. energy intake. If you look at the blue and orange line, which represents energy available and energy consumed, over the last 20 years, our caloric intake has pretty much stayed the same, around 2,200 calories a day, yet for some reason, the obesity rate, the red line, is continued to skyrocket from about 30% in 2000 to 43% in 2018. So according to the study, Americans on average have been taking in roughly the same amount of calories, but obesity rates are continuing to explode. So something is going on that's destroying our metabolic health. And I think there are probably a number of different contributors like eating too much sugar and processed foods, but today, we're gonna focus on one potential contributor that is perhaps a bit more hidden, but just as prevalent in our diet and one that has been hotly debated online in recent months and years, and that is the prevalence of seed oils in our diets. First off, what is a seed oil? It's a subset of vegetable oils that are derived from seeds of crops. Canola oil, sunflower oil, corn oil, grapeseed oil, soybean oil, just to name a few. My guess is that you have at least one of these in your kitchen that you cook with, but they are everywhere. Mazzola corn oil. Crisco oil. Vegetable corn and sunflower oil. Low-cost vegetable oil is in everything from packaged foods to restaurants and kitchens across the world. Vegetable oil. Canola oil. Vegetable oil. Canola oil. As consumption of vegetable oils exploded, rates of obesity and diabetes happened to explode with it. Two important things to point out. One, it's very important to make a distinction between correlation and causation. We have to be careful there. And two, seeing a montage like that makes me wonder how vegetable oils came to replace animal fat in our diet. This is from an article in the American Conservative, quote, indeed, vegetable oils rose to popularity in large part due to a marketing campaign by Procter and Gamble that framed these oils as a health food. Beginning with Ivory Soap, the entrepreneurial brothers found ways to produce a plethora of household staples per sheep by replacing animal fats with partially hydrogenated vegetable oils to earn a profit during the economic recession of the 1870s. So this, I think, was a good opportunity to point out that in many instances, you can find these underlying economic drivers and changes in public health guidance. In this case, a certain company would most certainly benefit almost in perpetuity from the public acceptance of a particular new product that they sell. So they'll fund certain nonprofit organizations and academic institutions to conduct studies on their behalf to convince people that their new product is better for you than what's already existing on the market. Those institutions that help them out also gain more prominence as a result. It's certainly an interesting ecosystem, this relationship between economics and science. I want to read to you an excerpt from a Wall Street Journal article entitled The Questionable Link Between Saturated Fat and Heart Disease. Quote, butter and lard had long been staples of the American pantry until Crisco introduced in 1911 became the first vegetable-based fat to win wide acceptance in U.S. kitchens. Then came margarines made from vegetable oil and then just plain vegetable oil in bottles. All of these got a boost from the American Heart Association, which Procter & Gamble, the maker of Crisco Oil, coincidentally helped launch as a national organization. In 1948, P&G made the AHA the beneficiary of the popular Walking Man radio contest, which the company sponsored. The show raised $1.7 million for the group and transformed it, according to the AHA's official history, from a small underfunded professional society into the powerhouse that it remains today. After the AHA advised the public to eat less saturated fat and switch to vegetable oils for a quote-unquote healthy heart in 1961, Americans changed their diets. 
Now these oils represent seven to 8% of all calories in our diet, up from nearly zero in 1900, the biggest increase in consumption of any type of food over the past century. Okay, so there's a little bit of the history, correct or incorrect, there was certainly some collaboration between corporations and the scientific community to convince Americans that vegetable oil is better for you than animal fat. So now that we understand that piece of history, let's talk a little bit about why doctors today are concerned about vegetable oil being a regular part of our diet. Average Americans today are eating five to six tablespoons of vegetable oils per day. That's around 700 calories of oil filled with polyunsaturated fat. It's almost impossible to get this amount naturally. There's so little oil per ear of corn that it takes 98 ears or 12,000 calories of corn to get you five tablespoons of corn oil. So a long industrial process is dedicated to ripping oil out of these tiny seeds. As mentioned earlier, polyunsaturated vegetable fats oxidize very easily. Oxidize simply means to react with oxygen. This is how metals rust, and this is why meat that you leave out turns brown after a while. Oxidation changes the structure and properties of fats for the worse. Heat is a great way to oxidize fats, and vegetable oil is repeatedly heated long before it ever arrives in a kitchen. There are many steps to create edible oil, and several of them involve very high heat. Vegetable oils also oxidize while sitting in your body, creating toxic oxidation products like an aldehyde called 4-HNE. 4-HNE is actually considered to be the most toxic aldehyde, and this compound has been associated with aging, heart disease, diabetes, and Alzheimer's. Neuroscientist Tetsumori Yamashima has done plenty of research on vegetable oils and 4-HNE. He's published multiple papers on the damaging effects of this compound and why people need to avoid vegetable oils because they oxidize into 4-HNE in our bodies. Polyunsaturated fats, oxidation, aldehydes, 4-HNE, it's all very technical, but essentially some experts are claiming that the manufacturing process of these seed oils makes the substance more or less a toxin that can harm our bodies and lead to illnesses like diabetes, heart disease, obesity, and many others if we consume it regularly. But with that being said, these claims aren't conclusive. Like we talked about earlier, correlation is not causation, right? You'll find some articles out there like this one from Consumer Reports. The headline reads, do seed oils make you sick? Critics say they raise your risk for weight gain, heart issues, and more. But the science doesn't support those claims, right? This isn't going to be the first time and it won't be the last time scientific studies come to differing conclusions. Science is just confusing. We, we have to think about and consider so many things like which research group conducted the study, who funded the study, how were the trials designed, was it peer-reviewed, and so many other variables. I think the truth is, based on all of my research so far on this topic, these trials are just too short. The proof, uh, this is an excerpt from a 1969 clinical trial studying the effects of eating unsaturated fat Quote, as indicated in Table 29 and discussed in some detail above, the excess mortality in non-atherosclerotic categories was not sufficiently impressive to justify the conclusion that harmful effects had been demonstrated. Nonetheless, this small excess non-atherosclerotic mortality in the late years of the study raises the very important and difficult question of whether future clinical trials of diets rich in unsaturated fat must be planned for periods well in excess of eight years rather than the five-year periods that have been the usual goal. Okay, so the situation is we don't really know for sure whether seed oils can be linked to obesity, diabetes, heart disease, and many other ailments. And my opinion is obviously that while the relationship between diseases like obesity, diabetes, heart disease, and eating vegetable oil is at this point at best correlational and not causational, we also cannot deny that our diet has changed tremendously in the last half century. Even Asian countries are getting fatter, which we all think of them as being much more healthy. Countries like Japan, China, and India all have recent documented surges in obesity rates because they too have increasingly adopted more Western food habits, like eating more sugar, which we know is bad for you, and also eating more processed foods, which all contain vegetable oil. Look, I think the causes for something like obesity is obviously a multifaceted issue. Vegetable oil is perhaps just one 
small component of why we're getting fatter and sicker, we'll have to wait for better designed, longer clinical trials. But in the meantime, I don't think we could talk about this topic and not mention the overall structure of food and drug regulation. The Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, is responsible for assuring that foods sold in the United States are safe, wholesome, and properly labeled. But at the same time, a not insignificant portion of the FDA is funded by Big Pharma. According to their website, 54%, that's $3.3 billion of their funding comes from the federal government, but the other 46%, that's $2.8 billion, comes from Big Pharma vis-a-vis industry user fees. And if Big Pharma's profit engine is fueled by the existence of sick patients, wouldn't it be great for them if, say, half or two-thirds or whatever the obesity number is today of adults in America were sick? Here's a headline for you. Buy Eli Lilly stock. Its obesity drug will be a blockbuster, analyst says. So here's the deal. I can't sit here in good conscience and say that there is some kind of global conspiracy of food and pharmaceutical executives and regulators in dark rooms devising ways to make people sick. But what I can say is that there is a certain economic benefit of normalizing obesity or convincing us to eat foods that sound healthy rather than to eat foods that are actually healthy. Anyway, those are just my thoughts about seed oils. What are yours? Please share them with us in the comment section below. I hope you found this segment to be helpful and informative. I actually have another segment on the food industry about the effects of fiber in our diet on my YouTube channel. So I would encourage you to go ahead and check that out. Subscribe to my channel, 5149 with James Lee. The link will be in the description below. Thank you so much for tuning into Breaking Points. And as always, I appreciate your time today. Cable news is ripping us apart, dividing the country, making it impossible to function as a society, and making it impossible to know just what is true and what is false. But the good news is they are failing and they know it. That is why we're building something new, a new mainstream, a healthier one, something more trustworthy, something that we are going to need in one of the most pivotal times in American history. We are building up here for the midterms, for the upcoming presidential election, but we need your help. So if you can help us out by becoming a premium member today at breakingpoints.com, we're trying to change America for the better and the entire world. So what are you waiting for, guys? Go to breakingpoints.com and sign up and help us build a new mainstream.